Thank you, Amina, for this uh, very gracious introduction. And I also thank uh, Professor Parida Siddiqui, who has uh, <clears throat> invited me to deliver this talk, and my colleague uh, Abdul Taha for coordinating this whole program. Thank you all once again. Now, friends, uh, uh, as uh, Professor Farida Siddiqui and Professor Amena are told that uh, this is meant for uh, teachers' uh, enlightenment and teachers' engagement for a discourse on constitution. And what values does the constitution have? And what is the present status of uh, Indian constitution? What is its future like? And as teachers in the universities, uh, how do we engage with this whole constitutional morality, whether it is about uh, the fundamental rights or duties or the whole range of structures that the constitution gave to this nation in 1950. As you all know that uh, the main uh, drafting committee chairman of the constitution is Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. If you Google about him, uh, what is he called? What is, how is he described? Uh, the Wikipedia bio of Ambedkar tells us that he was a polymath. Uh, I was trying to actually understand what is this whole concept of polymath. Polymath is one who has knowledge of various fields, not just one field. And uh, the whole world today recognized Ambedkar as a person of uh, multifaceted uh, knowledge uh, systems. And he synthesized many things at a very critical time of our nation. So he drafted this constitution and then it was adopted in 1950 when uh, Nehru, a, a secular person, was the prime minister. And of course, by then, Gandhi, who was outside the framework of constitutional structures, was already killed. But uh, he played a role in that. Malana Azad himself was part of the Constitutional uh, Constituent Assembly and uh, what kind of contributions he made, uh, one needs to look at. But one of the fundamental things that Ambedkar had to do in order to write a very sustainable constitution for a nation like India at a time when partition was happening and the whole world was in crisis. There was communist revolution all around. Soviet Union was already an advanced a socialist uh, nation. And just a year before China has become a communist country. And in India, there was a communist revolutionary upsurge for uh, you know, land reform and uh, economic equality, though they never recognized social and spiritual questions fundamentally. And in, in the other parts of the uh, 
world, particularly encircling India, there were a number of Muslim countries, though Pakistan was just born, and Bangladesh in the eastern part, and there was Indonesia, and then Afghanistan, and upwards. So there also there was there was no notion of strong democracy. Uh, so in the West, uh, democracy, of course, was uh, settled between uh, the British model, which was not a written constitutional model, but a conventionally evolved uh, model, and the American and the French uh, constitutional models, which had very written models, but French was undergoing a lot of uh, crisis, uh, one after the other, new constitutions were being drafted. And in the East, there were not many constitutional governments. China had a different one-party proletariat dictatorship, what they call People Democratic Revolutionary Dictatorship. And Japan had no structural constitution, though modeled on the British, uh, with a monarch and then a prime ministerial. But its constitution was going up and down. And then you have Eastern European countries, which were in crisis. Vietnam was in crisis, Korea was in. So it was in this global massive uh, confusion. Uh, India was to uh, go for a democratic constitution, which is not an easy task. So what America did was, uh, he actually walked on a razor blade uh, in order to frame this constitution in a manner that uh, India could adopt and sustain it. Within the Constituent Assembly, there were many religious pulls. There were very conservative Brahmins from Aladi Kupuswami to the, you know, uh, MB Kamath and so on. And uh, from East Bengal region, there were many, you know, Bengal has a history of producing so-called scholars. Uh, there were many from Bengal region, and most of them were traditional Hindus. Then, as, as a negotiating team within the Constituent Assembly, there was a small number of Muslim, English-educated people. Maulana Azad himself, though, was a self-educated English-educated man, but very well conversant with modern uh, democratic system. And there were other Muslim leaders who were English-educated, though most of them went to Pakistan side by then who were London educated. And uh, from the community, uh, there were hardly any shudras. Uh, you all know that uh, uh, Indian caste system was structured on four layers, what uh, Ambedkar called multiple uh, graded unequal hierarchical layers. The, the lowest and the most population carrying group was the Shudras. Many of them uh, were small landlords, some of them were uh, small Jagirdars and so on, but they were not English educated except uh, Sardar Vallabhai Patel, uh, there was no top uh, good English educated 
leader in the constituent assembly from Shudras. From Dalits, apart from Ambedkar, there were one or two, but they were not English educated. Tribals, there was hardly anybody. From women, there were few English educated women. Uh, Sarojini Naidu's daughter was there, though Sarojini Naidu by then, I think, must have passed. I don't remember exactly. But there were uh, women who came out of the uh, just uh, formulated reforms after Raja Ram Mohan Rai and Mahatma Jyoti Rao Pule in the Western India, Savitri Bai Pule became the first teacher. So some women went to England. Don't forget the fact that without English knowledge and speaking ability and reading ability, nobody could contribute anything to constitution making because it was a, a British uh, format and British legacy, not a Persian language legacy at all. Persian language ceased to be uh, the official language in 1834. And English took over. So the constitution makers were not Urdu educated, though Urdu was a national language, nor Persian. Persian like Sanskrit has already become defunct, non-existent, because it was never allowed to perhaps to become a kitchen language or production field language like Sanskrit. So it also seems to have died a very natural death. So the makers of the constitution was British, English, educated, and uh, uh, mainly largest numbers were Brahmins. Second section were Banyas, uh, including other walls. And then uh, uh, in North India, you have a community called Katris in the West. Uh, this is the community from which Manmohan Singh also comes. They were Patwaris uh, in the Hindu, highly educated, what is known as Dvijas, those who have sacred thread and the right to read Sanskrit and so on. This was a very substantial community which had English education, along with Brahmins. The second noble laret came from this community, from Lahore. So uh, Argobind uh, Kurana is a Khatri. The other community came from Eastern India, called Kayasthas. They were also Patwaris, who were managing the land records through written uh, structures. And there were Kshatriyas, uh, today you see Yodi, Yogi Adityanath and, and then only two Kshatriyas became, uh, uh, no, one Kshatriya, uh, VP Singh became the Prime Minister of India. Uh, no, no, Chandrasekhar also was a Kshatriya, he became Prime Minister. But they were not really a very uh, pro uh, you know, caste structured people. Both of them were socialist by mind and social justice was their agenda. So these communities were very strong in the Constituent Assembly and they were most English educated. And uh, in the name of nationalism, their agenda was to sustain the caste hierarchy and the values. Uh, see, for example, now there is a law being made in many states, uh, the law against Lao Jihad. What I preferably call is 
law against love. This will be the only country where laws are being made against love itself. Now, the woman's issue today has to be understood from what happened in the Constituent Assembly process. See, caste marriages were 100% uh, parental decided uh, marriages. At least 80% were child marriages. I don't know, I've not carefully studied the Islam Muslim situation by then, but one thing to me, it appears that even in Muslim society, uh, percentage I can't say, but uh, parental decision uh, may be more or less the same. Uh, there was hardly any scope for love marriage, even within the religion and communities. There were castes and communities in terms of class, the elite, the feudals, you have, uh, you have the old Mughal dynasty descendants, then you have Khans and so on and so forth. And there were lower castes who got converted. So what was the marriage system uh, within them? It was certainly not based on love, but arranged. And among the lower castes, there was also no scope for love marriage by then. Uh, it was by a lot child marriage. By my child, my uh, student days, by ninth class, if we were, by that age, 15, if we were not married, uh, we would be condemned as uh, bad people. Now I face that. You can see that in my autobiography. They used to call all names if you are not married by 15 as a boy, by 10, 11 as a girl, then there will be horrible problems. So it was in this situation, uh, the constitution has to handle high level institutions at one level. What should be our parliament? What should be our state legislatures? What should be our judiciary? And what should be our interstate relations? Uh, you know, all that is one section. But what should be the constitutional direction to social transformation? Was there a possibility to frame a constitution that guides social transformation? So there was a very strong resistance in the Constituent Assembly by the Brahmins, the Banyas, the Kayasthas, and the Katris, who had a historical advantage of acquiring wealth without involving in production. And the Muslim elite, because of the Constituent, uh, the, the partition and the trauma in 1947, I don't think seriously participated in the debate. Because even, even if you read the Maulana Azaz's uh, 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 autobiography, uh, biography book, autobiography also, you don't find much what he uh, argued for and in the Constituent Assembly and so on. Though as first education minister, he did something. So uh, the whole argument for social reform the structures, at least certain structures that need to go into social reform were to be extended by Ambedkar alone. Sardar Vallabhai Patel, though was a Shudra, uh, was a strong uh, follower of uh, Gandhi and uh, was not a great legalist or great right. He never wrote anything. So uh, he was by and large listening to the right-wing arguments and trying to accommodate them. 
and trying to convince Ambedkar, don't push social reform agenda too much into the constitution. Now, social reform agenda in India would have two dimensions. One, which is a concern of all communities, whether it was the larger, uh, the Shudra community, the Dalits, uh, the, the Dvijas, and all of them were clubbed into a concept called Hindu by then. Constituent Assembly constantly would discuss about Hindu. So what role social reforms could be allowed within Hindu? So in Hindu, there are two structures. One, abolition of caste. Two, bringing about man-woman equality. There was third dimension, which they never looked at actually. The third dimension was a production and dignity of labor issue. There was a huge problem, I think even in the Muslim society today, that in, 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 uh, in so-called Hinduism, uh, the top castes, uh, five castes don't participate in production at all. Uh, they consider tilling the land, uh, touching the mud and cattle rearing, then uh, agriculture, harvesting as pollution, what they call spiritual pollution. The whole range of sociology came on this idea and Eman Srinivas was a major contributor of this pollution theory. So they would never touch agriculture. And those who were working in different layers of tasks, like shoemaking, dead animal removal, cleaning of the village, tilling, harvesting, cattle rearing, all these were undivine and uh, anti-God, they said. Therefore, constitution would have used a language to uh, undo this, the dignity of labor should be the prime center of constitution, but then nobody raised it. Even Ambedkar did not go into that domain. Now, this dignity of labor question is equally serious among Muslim population in India. I have not seen any discourse on dignity of labor and man-woman equality both socially, in economic productivity, and in the spiritual domain. How there should be an Indian process by overcoming the global impositions and the, because Hinduism is only one country problem. What reforms it brings here, that is it here only. Uh, the other one is Nepal. But Nepal was never in the uh, discourse of democracy at that time. It was under kingship. So from kingship, it went into a communist domain. Radical reforms are taking place there in religion because I have a number of friends. And we also have uh, this kind of online discussion seminars now. So Islam had a global presence. Therefore, the Muslim society could not evolve pure Indian ethics of equality, labor, man-woman questions, and ask for constitutional uh, structures within. And that is the reason why now it is facing problems on triple talaq and then dignity of labor question in the women, women's participation in agrarian production on equal basis with men, and so on and so forth. But this, the, the, what we call the parda or the burqa problem for women is not just Muslim issue as they are making it out. The, the Brahmin, the Banya, the Kayasta, Katri, Kshatriya women never stepped out of house. And uh, they, they never entered into any art courses. You know, today, Kangana Rana, 
who is uh, strongly arguing for the present uh, regime is the first Kshatriya woman to come into film industry. So uh, she is also not highly English educated, but she is uh, she is trying to catch up. So uh, in many art forms, many uh, discourses, no more than anything, the social discourse on rights. In my view, rights cannot straight away be brought into human life by constitutions. The rights issue has to be brought into human life. One, the family discussions of rights, then the religion discussions of rights, and the civil societal discussions of rights, and then the schools, colleges, uh, in, in a larger way, have to discuss rights. But how do, how do the discourse of rights start? The discourse of rights, for example, among the Shudras, Dalits, Adivasis, there is no notion of book at all. There is no notion of God's book. So we were only historically idol worshippers. So uh, there was no idea of book and writing and so whether it is property, whether it is anything we uh, only go by, the traditions evolve within the caste panchayat relationships. So there is no book reference point to us. Whereas the Brahmins, the Banyas and others, the, what we call the Dijas have Vedas as reference point, Bhagavad Gita, Ramayana, Mahabharata, but not for us. The Christians have Bible. In Indian Christians, I see a lot of man-woman inequality and total lack of participation in production. And uh, though their man-woman relationship are far better than others, because I participate in many of their meetings. Uh, uh, the way they dress, the way they eat together, the way they uh, uh, participate in functions, religious or non religious It's completely both uh, mixed. So among the Muslims, the Quran was the reference book. Uh, but how much the question of rights was uh, discoursized within the family, within the religion, within the masjid, based on the Quranic uh, ideas, I'm not sure. There's not much research. So you all need to work on that research. Because all of, them, all of us must remember the idea of constitution is not an automatic secular idea. The idea of constitution as it evolved in the West, starting with the John Locke's theory of uh, uh, treatise on constitution, uh, way back in the early 17th century in England, they all emerged this idea of constitution from biblical discourses, Bible. Now, what was the central point there? The central point there was, what is the divine right? What is the right that God has given us? So the rights were divided into divine and political and secular, social and so on. So the first idea was, what, what, is, what is the right that God has given us? Now, the major debate started in England Germany, France, and America after the slave society was formed. What are the rights of slaves in a Christian society, in a Christian house? 
are they created by god as equals or not this was the fundamental issue before them it was not the constitution it was, then they referred to the bible but for a long time they did not uh, decipher any uh, language of uh, rights in the bible uh, but suddenly some thinkers saw that there was a scope of rights debate within the old testament itself that's where the idea started what is that in the genesis part of the bible the first chapter itself talks about god creating human beings equal this is the central point from which uh, the american constitution was drafted it was jefferson who was a very young man at that time he was only 34 and he drafted the american constitution very small constitution but then the first principle that he laid down in the constitution was that god created all human beings equal now how much of this debate though whenever i read quran i find there was a discussion on slaves and how to treat slaves and all that but how much of debate around the idea of Uh, uh, allah or god creating equal and developing that into a major theory of constitution happened in islamic civilization i am not sure so ambedkar then dug up the equality idea from indian spiritual resources and that was buddhism when i did my phd i was surprised the buddhist texts had a notion of human beings being equal not in the god realm because buddha did not believe in god equal in sangha sangha is society of an organized so there was man woman in equality but the women were asking for membership in the sangha in 6th century bc mind you and then buddha said no you know if if women come into sangha sanghas will survive only for 500 years otherwise if they are only of men sangha they will survive for 1000 years so women will reduce the age of sangha for 500 years that was because now buddhism survived for longer time but then his own step mother pressed him saying on one spiritual morality question when gautam buddha took uh he gave up his kingdom and then took uh, his uh, his uh, monkhood he said every human being can attain nirvana nirvana is a sort of moksha moksha is in 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 uh, in uh, uh, quranic language uh, the heaven or the you know uh, ultimate uh, permanent life so then his, his step mother asked when you use that every human being can attain nirvana was women included in that or not and he was struck he said uh, maybe i i was not uh, in that uh, in that understanding then his disciples men also said then how can you say human being human being is both man and woman so finally buddha was defeated in the argument and women's admission was granted as the bikunis in the buddhist sanghas so ambedkar drew the idea of liberty equality fraternity from buddhist philosophy and this was his major strength to consistently fight the brahmins and others in the constituent assembly who were saying don't think of abolishing this that this is our tradition this is our civilization he said no 
Civilization does not mean what you are saying in Vedas. Civilization also means Buddhism. See, for example, the scholars must understand, particularly from Maulana Azad and other universities, there is a debate going on food rights. Whether India should respect all mixed cuisine food right, where human being can eat anything is not poisonous, or it should respect the religious sentiments, whatever could be the religious sentiment, and then gradually become vegetarian, turning the whole nation into vegetarian. There is a book of mine uh, published online uh, by Jaggernaut. You can see that its title is Anti-National Vegetarianism. My argument is the, the right-wing scholars on food rights argue that yes, uh, Cow is our sacred animal, and those who eat cow and beef in the larger sense are anti-nationals. Then when we try to counter them, their argument is, now why are you not opposing Muslims or not eating pig? So they are sentimental about pork, and we are sentimental about our beef. We don't allow this. They don't allow that. We don't, whatever could be the reasons. So uh, I had to go back to Indus Valley Civilization, which was 1500 years prior to writing of Rig Veda, the first Vedic text. Indus Valley Civilization, yesterday, the most uh, powerful. Uh, Cambridge School came out with a uh, research paper that Indus Valley people first built surplus food through storing animal meat. What does the animal meat consist? The animal meat consisted of buffalo meat because buffaloes were very hugely domesticated in India then bull meat, then goat, and uh, uh, sheep, and pig. They found in the pots uh, the evidences of all this meat. So my question again at them is that, look, my civilization is in the first Indus Valley food culture. Today, we combine all that. In our villages, we do all that. So you claim your thing from Vedic period. Then the Muslims say that from our text, you know, this is what we don't eat. But India is different. India is Indus Valley. India built the first city in the world. India built the first villages. India built the surplus food. So therefore, Ambedkar's view was India should be a plural, open, Okay, personal likes and dislikes you can grant, but constitutionally, you cannot give scope for sentiment. But unfortunately, you could not put huge language into it. So finally, with Gandhi's uh, arguments and a lot of others' arguments and the directive principles, cow protection has gone in. Then uh, my argument is, if cow is a constitutional animal to be protected, why not buffalo? And as he was asking this question, the Supreme Court Chief Justice, Justice Varma, in 2001, when we were taking caste issue to United Nations in Durban, that caste inequality has its roots in race inequality. 
you know, you also must understand there is no huge debate on racial issues in the Islamic world. I think it should debate. Caste inequality, when we said, is has its roots in racial inequality. The committee that was constituted by Vajpayee government, headed by two chief justices, former chief justices, Justice Verma and Justice Ranganath Misra, said, no, race and caste have no common ground. Then my argument was very simple. Race and caste have common grounds. Caste emerged out of race. How the first migration to India was from Africa. It is a migrational theory is now very clear. So the Indus Valley civilization builders were Indo-Africans. And they mutated and became multicolored people. By the time, the fourth migration. See, all of you must read a book as social scientists, natural scientists, written by Tony Joseph. This is the most, uh, you know, uh, most uh, structural changing social science debate in India, which was published in 2018, called Early Indians. Now, Tony Joseph proved with DNA evidence and archeological evidence, that Indo-Aryan migration is the fourth migration, 15th century BC. So we, as the Dravidians, who had the Indo-African roots, are black in color, and therefore we could domesticate buffalo, unlike other people in the world, and converted that animal into a milk-producing animal. Now, why don't you respect buffalo? You drink its white milk, but you don't respect it because it is a black animal. Now, this is where my buffalo nationalism came. So I asked Justice Varma that, sir, if one fine morning a buffalo was to walk into your Supreme Court and ask for equal right with cow, what do you say? He was very upset. I said, you would have simply dismissed the board and wash. How did you oppose this, uh, allow this black buffalo into Supreme Court? So what is the constitutional morality there? The constitutional morality is not color equality. Cow is a white animal, therefore you respect. Therefore, Ambedkar was very clear that spiritual morality alone can safeguard constitutional so religious societies today must reposition their spiritual morality. The strength of a spiritual morality is the society operating on very strong moral ground within yourself. And that will condition and oppose the others who is immoral. So therefore, uh, the rights of constitutional morality have come from spiritual morality. I was just uh, a month back giving a talk to judges and lawyers uh, on online on, on spiritual morality and constitutional morality basis and difference. I said so long as Indian constitutional operators in the courts, lawyers, judges, and academicians if they don't ground their strength on spiritual morality, man woman inequality, intercaste marriages, or interreligious marriages will not be tolerated. They will be killed. Many people don't study what is happening in the country. A, a Dalit boy, a Vaishya girl, got married in Mirial Guda. The boy was hacked on the roads. And then a Reddy girl and a Vaishya boy got married in Hyderabad. The Reddy boy was killed by the whole family by kidnapping him. Then there was a Dalit girl in UP. She was gang raped and burnt in midnight. 
And then there was a case which uh, Kangana has made it a big thing that a Muslim boy loved a non-Muslim girl. She refused it. He went and hacked her, shot dead. Now, now the laws come into effect that if a, a so-called Hindu boy or Muslim girl or Muslim boy or Hindu girl come get married, no, that becomes laudia. It cannot be allowed. So law cannot be allowed legally in India now. So where are we landing? We are landing in a situation where the right to law is in problem. Now they are saying the right to love in religion wise, okay, conversion. But what about caste? There is a very famous case in Tamil Nadu of Kausilya case. Kausilya is a Kausilya is a very famous activist now. Our Dalit husband, she is a uh, upper caste uh, girl. A Dalit boy was married. Her parents saw to it that he was hacked. And she saw to it that her parents were hanged to death. They got death sentence, but Supreme Court uh, commuted that to life. She is now fighting again. So this, this, this past intercaste marriages, why killing? There is an unwritten manudharma law here. You can kill them. So therefore, uh, when you are talking about human rights in India, you have to talk about the socio-spiritual rights. And uh, we are raising that issue now very seriously. The right to become priest in the temples, both by Shudras, Dalits, if they are defined as Hindu, and both by men and women. The debate can get, get into any religion now. And uh, whether it is Islam, Christianity, uh, and the right to vote has come to a logical end now. So when Bandari Naike became the first women prime minister of Sri Lanka, the world cried against her. But now, normally, yes, uh, in, in every country, Muslim women also are becoming prime ministers. So therefore, the constitution has been put in place by Ambedkar with a razor blade uh, tightrope walking, but there are various ways to subvert it. And he said that the best of a constitution by people who want to destroy it can be misused and destroyed. So bad people can make a a, a good constitution not work, good people can make a bad constitution work. It is not what the death document says, but what is the morality of the people. So this moral basis lies in spiritual morality, social morality. The, 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 so, uh, you know, uh, I'm repeatedly reminded, I don't know how many of you are reading Obama's uh, uh, memoirs, um, even reviews or his own uh, excerpts. Uh, he, he made one speech just before the American uh, election took place that uh, when Trumpism was really aggressively uh, operating, he said, no, American constitution is based on the idea of all human beings created equal by God. If this America practices white racism, it is anti-constitutional. And Trump represents white racism. Therefore, all Americans should reject it, including whites. And uh, I think his, his speech became very credible. And having served as president of America for eight years as a black with a Muslim father in the back background. So uh, it is important that uh, uh, the Indian constitution should be preserved. 
uh, uh, you know, in future, uh, when Indian Express asked me to write an article on rise of Asaduddin OYC and then uh, All India Jamate, uh, Jamaat, uh, 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 MIM winning the elections on its own by formulating uh, blocks. Uh, where does the secularism discourse, majority minority discourse uh, operated? You know, I wrote in that article, which would appear perhaps next Monday or so, that the whole idea of secularism, which though is a very strong constitutional foundation, is not being bought by Shudras, Dalis, uh, Adivasis, even Muslims. The reason was, that after attacking secularism, once BJP came to power, the question of identity became central. So Muslims want Muslim identity as more central than the majority minority issue. So their identity was submerged in minoritarianism. So uh, we did a lot of study on uh, such, uh, the, uh, the the reports on Muslim backwardness, illiteracy, and so on. And what happens with this kind of uh, future uh, is that uh, the the communal conflicts will come to big urban centers in future. Uh, Delhi is one such thing we could see. So in order to avoid this, we have to write more and more on how to safeguard Ambedkar constitution with an idea of identity and secularism. The Shudras, the Dalis, uh, you know, many Shudras are the regional leaders now. There are hardly any Shudra leaders in Delhi and they are not English educated. So that is the reason why my final feeling is, we all must ask for all of our children being educated in English medium from LKG to 12th, all children, whatever could be their religion, whatever could be their caste, gender, uh, then all of our children in the villages will overcome the child marriage problem because the 12th grade should reach to village. And then English should be accepted as national language because that is what framed this constitution. Other languages don't have that, that global uh, 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 structural knowledge base discourse to, uh, to evolve uh, uh, moral, ethical, ideological, national things. So Telugu, Tamil, Malayalam, Urdu, you know, this, this ghettoization of language speaking is also destroying us. The OBCs are going against Muslims because in Muslim areas, they speak in Urdu and remain within themselves. So the OBCs speak only regional languages. There are no all India, English speaking intellectuals from among them. So we should have one language as a national language and other languages for our market, home, uh, community purposes. That is a different issue. So we should put America's mind. Everybody should own India as a long ancient nation with Arapan civilization our, as our base. There were no religions at that time, but there were production. There was all kinds of food experiments. They avoided poisons and ate non-poisons. So they gave us the food cultural values and we should debate food discourse 
food right issue also. I remember in 1996 when I wrote first article in EPW on the right to eat uh, any food item that they want, including beef. There was a huge attack on me by people around me itself. They were asking, are you a beef eater? No, that's not the question. Whether I eat or not, I would defend the people's right to eat it. Because that proved to be a non-poisonous food. Then they started attacking us. Do you support Muslims eating pork? Yes, I'm a pork eater. My father used to eat it. My family used to eat it. So this, this question doesn't arise. Therefore, uh, it is in this uh, context we need to really study the background of the nation, where our roots are, whatever religion you become be, 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 belong to or caste, gender you belong to, our, as our Indian, and we must own Indian nationhood with our sweat and blood and labor. All of us must be part of the labor and dignity of labor should be central. And I think there should be an article in the Indian constitution. I am trying to campaign for that about the dignity of, respect to dignity of labor in Indian constitution and education. Thank you. I will take questions now. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Kanchayala sahab. Bahut zabardast thought provoking aapka lecture raha. Ab mein tamam participants se dakhas karti hoon ki ye session question and answers ke liye open kiya jata hai. Uh, questions bilkul uh, related to this uh, topic. Aaj ka jo topic hai, usi se related ho. Aur uh, sir ka jo lecture raha, iske context mein jo questions ho sakte hain, wo questions karein. Aur question ko question ki tarah hi karein. Uh, uh, bahut cho, chota sa ho question aur sab ko iska mokha diya jai. Uh, main ab ye session open karti hoon. Questions ke liye. आप क्वेश्चन टाइप भी कर सकते हैं अगर से बोल नहीं पाए तो चैट करके चैट में टाइप कर सकते हैं यू कैन आस्क इन उर्दू और एनी लैंग्वेज आर इंग्लिश या एनी लैंग्वेज शायद अनम्यूट करना है या देखना है हाँ मैं उसे कहा अनम्यूट करने के लिए जी पार्टिसिपेंट्स तक आवाज जा रही है यस मैम थैंक यू सर इट वाज अ वेरी इंफॉर्मेटिव लेक्चर my question is very simple and basic, perhaps a layman's question. Uh, what's the difference between freedom and liberty? Okay. Could you please elaborate on the distinction between these two values? Thank you. Well, uh, the, the idea of liberty became a very major with the French Revolution. Uh, but the concept of freedom was quite old. If you look at the, the Greek uh, literature or, or the Buddhist literature, the word free was used in many contexts. But the idea of liberty was used uh, with, a, with a interconnected but with a different meaning that liberty is a notion of freedom and uh, more than that, the political and institutional framework. Freedom is individualist, uh, you know, we, we say in normal course, 
uh, personal freedoms. But we don't use the word personal liberty. So liberty is a political, uh, constitutional, and uh, ideological uh, issue. So when the French Revolution uh, used, uh, you know, tracing from um, uh, various uh, French thinkers, uh, it was used with the idea that old systems should be uh, transformed or with a revolution, new system should be brought in. So liberty, equality, and fraternity. Fraternity as actually is brotherhood, sisterhood, so on and so forth. And liberty is conjoined with the notion of equality. That uh, I am equal to you. I should be equal to you. Each one should be equal to the other. That freedom does not mean equal. So uh, in that sense, the notion of freedom is social. Even in the religious systems, the word freedom was used in various senses. But liberty concept came with a political ideology of equality and liberation. Uh, the slave question came. The women's issue came in. The Now the race question comes in. So this is uh, perhaps the main uh, uh, difference, but there is a fundamental difference in that. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, this is Ashraf Nawaz. Ashraf Nawaz, uh, yes. Uh, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, Sir, recently Karnataka government has passed a bill uh, anti uh, cattle slaughter uh, uh, cattle slaughter bill. Hmm. So it includes uh, all types of you know buffalo and cow and all these things. Uh, hmm. You mentioned that uh, earlier when the uh, constitution was in making, uh, hmm. they did not include that. So what's your view regarding this? No, no, no. See, this debate has been repeatedly coming. Why only cow? Uh, why not buffalo? Why not uh, other milch animals? Uh, for example, goat and sheep also are milch animals in certain parts. And then uh, the directive principles of state policy talked about safeguarding drought animals. That is those animals which are useful for agrarian production. So, but there is a specific clause, a uh, special mention of cow uh, for uh, protection. Now, all these uh, governments, when they are passing uh, laws, see, this is a new uh, uh, discourse in law now. Normally, in any country, uh, there is no singled out uh, animal for protection. Or in any country, there is no law uh, against love. Uh, this, is, this is a very new uh, way of bringing laws. Now, this is only to uh, camouflage the overall issue of cow protection. See, what happened, unfortunately, not many Muslim scholars also did not realize is the way beef is seen in the battle was beef is seen as a Muslim food. But actually, it is much more a tribal food, much more a Dalit food. It is not just Muslim food or there are a number of Christians who eat uh, there are a number of OBCs who eat beef. Second, they, they included beef uh, with, they, they equated beef with cow meat. So Karnataka government uh, brought out the law 
No, all laws actually Maharashtra or Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, wherever BJP earlier Congress also brought some uh, cow protection laws and so on. All of them talk about general broad elements, but the specific target is cow. So uh, that is where my argument is, you know, it should be individual agenda, but not a legal agenda and social agenda. If somebody wants to... No, somebody is using the mic, okay? So, please. Uh, one should uh, unmute their mic and other should not speak. So uh, the, the question is individual sentiments, individual rights, individual uh, approaches to food uh, should be one dimension. But when you are making a legal dimension, uh, no single animal, whether with this sentiment or that sentiment, would be uh, allowed in a nation. And I think Constitution is silent on this, but uh, we need to uh, work a way to uh, really overcome this problem. Thank you, sir. Ji, koi aur? Koi aur sawal karna chahte hain? Hello, Dr. Taha. Me. Uh, kindly read out those questions what we received, because uh, here I am unable to read the, those questions. I think two or three questions we received on the inbox. Please read out. Uh, दो दो क्वेश्चंस आए थे वो डिस्प्ले हो रहे थे मेरे पास से वो मिस हो गए हैं ओके प्लीज अगर से किसी कहीं डिलीट हो गए फिर से प्लीज सेंड मैं अडबल प्लीज या 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 प्लीज या इंट्रोड्यूस योरसेल्फ प्लीज दिस इज डॉक्टर सलाहुद्दीन सईद ओके Thanks a lot, Professor Ilaya, sir. Uh, it's uh, really wonderful. Uh, and you raised so many issues and you gave the idea of how teachers like me and all of the newcomers could help. However, I came from science background, but I would like to ask you that, how important it is. Like you, as you mentioned, it's very important to save our constitution. Uh, teachers like me at this university, how proper and how appropriate. We could tell students and convince them that how important it is to save our constitution, especially in these days, because we see so many judgments, which are more towards not on facts, but based on uh, means beliefs and all other stuff. And now it's very important to save the constitution, which don't look for religion, don't look for back, means where it is coming from, it looks on facts. So where do you think that? It's important for all of our teachers because we all are newcomers, how we can have an interaction with different students from different categories, different uh, subjects, and trying to convince them that it's very important, we should all come forward and save our democracy. Thank you, sir. Well, one thing uh, the teachers of science uh, should actually talk to uh, students of science also, along with social science or arts is that look, India is a country of 1.35 billion people. <clears throat> and uh, I was just comparing where do we stand vis-a-vis -vis China? China is a country of 3.4 billion people. But the land size of India is 3.7 million square kilometers. The land size of China is 
9.6 million square kilometers. That means the biggest populated countries in the world are situated in unequal land size uh, planes uh, system. So our production should be much more per capita labor-based production than an average Chinese production. Because uh, uh, the, the land size is small and the population is big. We need to feed all of them. Whereas the Chinese land size is big, land, population size is big, land size is equally viable for uh, maintaining all those people. Now, with this uh, land size, with this kind of people, when we adopted the constitution, our population was roughly about 45 crore. Now, today we are 135 crore. So how did we feed this population? Today we are definitely better eating, even the poorest of the poor, uh, before the pandemic and uh, recent crisis, definitely people were eating better food, uh, wearing better clothes. Still there is uh, inequality, Farida knows as an economist, what kind of inequality we have. But this development, within the 70 years was possible because of democracy and this constitution. If this also goes, then we will enter a phase of, uh, you know, there is a political science may, uh, Hobbesian state of nature. So human being against human being, uh, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and we will be in the bloody wars for food. Because the production, even now, as per my estimation, 40% of our people don't participate in production at all. And uh, within the 60%, uh, about 30% of children the remaining people only produce by working on the land. And we have seen in pandemic how agriculture saved India from food crisis. People were working very hard in the agrarian field. So if this constitution is dismantled, India is gone. Everybody's food in the plate is gone. That fear you must put in the mind of people whatever could be a background. It is this constitution. Uh, you know, there is a talk about, you know, dictatorship, putting development on higher plane, this and that. And my communist friends tell me that uh, communist regimes. But uh, we have now, uh, for example, I keep writing and telling that Indian Muslim population is Better, in better position today, tell the world, other Muslims also, that how democracy has improved their life. And they are now used to democracy and right to vote, to change governments. In other countries, even in Arab Spring, nothing changed. So there is a talk about changing this constitution to presidential, and drastic amendments and so on and so forth. There is a section which talks about going back to the Manudharma values, another section going to the communist values and so on. Or there could be uh, other religious people to think that this whole democracy is a meaningless thing. But my assessment is, but for democracy, and this constitution, we would not have had this life. So tell this to the students, we must fight to sustain it. 
will not radically disturb it, whatever could be the force. Hello. Yes, Mr. Imamula, do you want to ask uh, any question? Yes, I do have a question. May yes. I? Yeah. yeah, please, go ahead. All right, uh, thank you, Professor Ilaya. It was wonderful, again, listening to you uh, talking to us about some of the most important and fundamental issues that India is facing today. Um, I think Professor Elia is off. I can't see him. No, no, no. I'm here. I'm All there. right. Yeah, yeah. All right. Now, now I can see you. I, I can hear. I can hear you. Yeah. Yes. Um, um, I would like to ask you um, something that you just spoke uh, about, and I was wondering uh, if you could elaborate on that a little bit more. Uh, which is uh, some kind of a connection between spiritual morality and the constitutional morality. Can you put your and, camera uh, on? Can you put your camera on? Let me just try. I am a student of history and... Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. No, me... no, whether, whether I saw you, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you can see. Okay, yeah. Yes. So um, this is what I was uh, wondering, that if we can talk about this uh, close connection that you uh, draw between uh, spiritual morality and constitutional morality. And you seem to suggest uh, that uh, constitutional morality should be based or rather inspired and directed by the spiritual morality. I don't know what you mean by spiritual here. I would presume that uh, you mean something otherworldly, if not religious. Uh, some people like to make a distinction between religious and spiritual as uh, Buddha did, Ambedkar did many others do. I don't know what do you mean by that, but I assume that there is something called otherworldly, uh, which is spiritual, if not religious, in the strict sense of the term. Hmm. But let me take this discussion forward by um, uh, drawing your attention to a very fundamental issue in Indian history, which we all know. Um, and um, being a medievalist, I, I, I like somehow believe that um, why not constitutional morality should be inspired uh, by something called reason or something called rationalist interpretation rather than spiritual morality? You know, why I suggest so? Because um, I was reminded of uh, the discussion and rather the dispute, the historical dispute between Ambedkar and Gandhi in the late 1920s. Uh, and one of the major... Um, I'm sorry, I got it. So one of the major bone of contentions between the two stalwarts was the idea that Gandhi was, if not, Gandhi was of course religious, but he was also spiritual. And the Ambedkar said that, no, uh, I want the political representation. And that became the major uh, like battleground between the two. Gandhi was all for reforms, but Ambedkar said that, no, I want political representation for the Khalid first. And then um, uh, I would not be uh, uh, temple entry, but I rather want Dalits to be represented to be a part of the political decision making process. Yeah. Now, if if I, I would assume that, that Ambedkar's understanding and the dispute uh, with Gandhi was majorly based on Ambedkar's reasoning, because Ambedkar could foresee that. It is the very rationalist understanding of the historical process through which a larger section of Indian society was marginalized and pushed uh, uh, behind, way behind than the other communities. So it is now the need of the hour to be politically represented, to be equally powerful in terms of decision-making process so that we can socially also transform the society. Now, mm -hmm. I was wondering that why would you still like to believe and um, like insist on thinking that uh, let the constitutional morality and the political idea also be guided and inspired by spiritualism rather than rationality and reason. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you, uh, bro uh, you brought in this whole question of reason and uh, morality. Now, my understanding is reason has two dimensions. One, as Bertrand Russell and uh, many writers try to argue, that reason essentially is uh, 
central to the atheist view of uh, social development. Therefore, the high reason thinkers uh, came from the atheist uh, basis. You know, that is what he proposed when he talked about uh, why I'm not a Christian. Uh, in fact, many people, recently there is a one, uh, a one Brahmin woman, surprising to, my, my, to myself, wrote a book, Why I'm Not a Hindu Woman. And she mentioned the three books in that. Why I'm Not a Hindu, my book, and uh, Warwick's Why I'm Not a Muslim, and Why I'm Not a Christian, but in Russell. And she tries to draw from that. So the other group says that religion per se is not out of the reason. Even religion within itself has a major domain of reason. Now, it is this major domain of reason that led to formulation of God creating human beings equal. Because it is rationalist can, like Karl Marx, think of equality. But what is the social base on which you are formulating that equality? Did it work? Now, within the Dalit, Shudra, Bahujan movements, we have been debating this. For example, Periyar Ramswami Nayaka built his old Dravidian movement on atheism reason. There is no God, there is no God, there is no God. That was his slogan. If you see any statue of Periyar in, anywhere, that will be the slogan. But I have been saying, look, you know, Mahatma Phule, Ambedkar, even myself, we don't think that that way can influence Indians today and even the global people. I am convinced after working in Maulana Azad University for seven years on spiritual taste, morality, getting repositioned to sustain ourselves, then on moving to Atheist reason per se is based on one observation from outside. And that observation is after my work, my engagement with the Muslim community, colleagues, friends, discussions. See, all Muslims do uh, fast in Ramadan. All Muslims. Uh, this uh, includes a society of about uh, 2.5 uh, 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 250 crore people or so. Now, can a state a constitution based on pure reason and atheism can make people fast from morning 4 o'clock to 7 o'clock, or the command of God, which is central in the world, is making all of them to do that. Then I came to a formulation that even today, not only in the Islamic domain, even in other religious societies, other different uh, groups and so on. God is controlling more minds than state. Now this is many people are uh, trying to dispute with me. I said, God is ruling many people to behave even with this much of discipline in the human life today, then the state laws can do that. Now, therefore, 
The spiritual morality I'm talking about is not that you do, uh, you go to temple or you go to ma uh, church or you pray on this day or that day or you do namaz or so. But the spiritual morality I'm talking about is that human beings, if not by evolution, assuming that creation happened through design of God, okay, human being is here. And this human being must be accepted as equal in the religious domain, even to reformulate your religious text. See, for example, I have been asking uh, the Brahmin pundits who have been debating with me, no, 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 how can you go against this, that, and why are you criticizing? I said, you rewrite your text. You remove caste from all your texts. I will come and sit, let us rewrite the text and make every sentence to flow in such a way that, that all these religious people are equal. And let us create a common text. Therefore, one you, you examine uh, whether uh, more fundamentally the Christian ethic. The Christian ethic before Christ was complete slave, horrendous anti-woman, and prostitution was very badly accepted. And Jesus came and gave a moral code of conduct. He personally uplifted brought out prostitutes. And then he went again as slavery. And he, he, he got killed in the process. But then from that to third century, there was horrible form of Catholic practice. Inequality was huge. Then came the Martin Luther rebellion, reinterpretation, relanguageization, remolding. And then the whole question of slavery and inequality was opposed from reinterpreting the same Bible. Not rewriting, but reinterpreting. And when the translations came, words, meanings were changing towards human equality. So in Islam, I think this much not happened uh, from first seventh century to till now, though there were changes. I was asking one question all Muslims. Some of them were very angry, particularly after I came out of uh, Maulana Azhar. Tell me, SCST, OBC, minority unity, we are shouting. And when there is a problem, we come to your rescue. But did you ever come to our rescue in 800 years of your rule? Did you write a single book in Persian against caste? Did you write a single book again in Urdu against caste, untouchable? Did you not see this as anti-Allah system here? Now, why you did not write? Who were these scholars? Then how is it that Alberoni in 13th century writes about caste and untouchability, later nobody writes, even the modern scholars. Why? What happened? Now, where was the Indianness of Islam here? The Indianness of Islam should have been with the Dalit Adivasi Shudra. Okay, you should have brought our women to equal level of your woman, though there are problems there. But you didn't. Why? The same question to the Christians. Yesterday I was on a major international conference asking them, whom did you teach English in your Saint Stephen, Saint Joseph, Saint Mary, and Saint Lyolas, and Madras Christian College, did you teach Dalit Adivasis or Sudras? Or you taught those who learned Sanskrit, those who learned Persian, and today you made them Indian English intellectuals handing all ambassador posts outside, not a single Shudra there, not a single Dalit. So how should we support you as Christians if you are attacked? Why should we? 
Where was your spiritual morality? Where was your Bible interpretation towards us, towards the poor? Now the same, you quote the same Jesus who said, poor alone can go to heaven. The rich will have to pass through the needle, the hole of the needle into heaven. Therefore, rich cannot go. Now you were Jesuits, did not marry. You were nuns, did not marry. And I told in one of the meetings, what you committed atrocity on us was, at least if you were to be married and produced more people, there would have been more Christians here. Then uh, sacrificing and teaching the same people who oppressed us for so long. Now they are international, anti-colonial intellectuals oppressing us in JNU, Delhi University, everywhere. They study English, they don't want us to learn English. So this question is, you have to first reinterpret your book if you are a book-based religious person. Keeping equality and God at one place. You know, when I was interviewed on that wire, when my books were banned in Delhi University, that famous lady, you know, who uh, interviews in wire this thing, she asked me, do you believe in God? I said, yes. She was surprised. I thought you were an atheist. Then uh, what is your God? Who is your God? I said, my God is equality. I wrote on my wall, my God is equal, equality. And I want to see that everyone believes that God. Till then, the fight. So the question is, if Supreme Court lawyers, judges, operate on caste morality, they are operating on manudharma morality. That is the reason why a Dalit does not get justice. And then if you are a spiritual morality, believe in God, creation equal. Don't allow caste to come in. Exist. If you believe as a Muslim, divine spiritual morality, don't allow any inequality between man and woman. Just don't allow it in any form. That is the point. The same text can be reinterpreted. We don't know text can be rewritten or, or re. But at least in our time, in young generation like you, and that is the reason why I told you now, where does the Muslim history start? Why do you get cornered with RSS, BJP? They say Muslim history starts only with Prophet Muhammad in the seventh century. Even in India, it, they don't recognize earlier history. And Christian history starts with Jesus and then Saint Thomas. And where is the Buddhist history? Buddhist history starts with Buddha. I'm saying all of us must start our history with Arab. Let us go back to our roots. You may be Muslim, I may be not belonging to any religion or some other religion, but we are Indians with the productive labor. And therefore, all religious texts must be interpreted in relation to production. I have not seen a single book on Bible and production, but Quran and production. What did Quran say about agricultural production, about animal economy, about you know, shoe making, about pot making, and then how it should be sanctified as equal to any other prayer to him. It, it, a Hindu cannot, a Brahmin cannot do it. He doesn't believe in it. But you also don't do it from your Quran point. You don't do it from your Bible point. So therefore, does God told us, tell us that not to produce and eat? No. But you have to look at it. So therefore, when I'm talking about spiritual morality, I'm talking about the idea of God being there, keep equality as a centrality of that and mold every institution around it. We will definitely improve from where we are to a higher level. And after that, what happens, I can't tell you. Anybody, uh, tomorrow, you know, you are 
within your 20s and 30s, you might reinterpret the whole history differently. To see one thing, a Shudra girl studies in Cambridge and becomes an ancient Indian history scholar, and she brings out that Harappans ate beef. It shocked them today. The, the birth, it is the root. And if it, if it were to be a Brahmin girl, she would not have done that. She is a young research scholar. Yeah, I read the So therefore, my, when I'm saying, see, all, all these things, when we, see, in India, you know, uh, my feeling is all of us social scientists must understand. In India, our generalization level is very low, even the best of the scholars. Our generalization levels are very low because of caste and other factors. We did not evolve into a high plane of utopian thinking. You have to construct a utopia. It may be not possible to reach. So therefore, my point is, uh, I would like to reform the Shudra Dalit Adivasi society, women for equality. Whenever I say argue with my Muslim friends, why not uh, all women equal with men? Why that uh, Muslim man's attitude that you know they should not come into masjid or this and that? Then Hinduism will say that all our women are going into temples along with men; they rub shoulder to shoulders. Then we are better liberated. You are living in India, where so many experiments are happening. So you change here as per this plan and bring about equality. You are not in one pure Muslim country. There are multiple operations. So therefore, uh, they say, no, 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 this is not our. No, I would say equality is my goal. Whether it's man or woman, I don't see the gender dimension. Then spirituality will influence more than re rational thing. It doesn't mean that there is no rationality in this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. May I, may I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. May I ask one question, sir? Yeah. This is no, again Salahuddin. Yeah, you have been mentioning that the produce, why the Quran fails or most of our representatives of Islam fail to talk about produce, I would like to remind you that maybe the people from Arabic or Islamic background can tell better, but if when it comes to the produce uh, professions, Quran actually encourages you or encourages Muslim that Muslim should adapt the profession of produce, be it in agriculture, be a herding a sheep, all profits have to go through these three professions and it's preferable. And it's always encourages you and it tells you that when somebody works for you, you have to pay the whatever his means payment before his sweat dried up. Okay, unfortunately, well, well. representatives misrepresent or don't talk much. Okay, I mean, if it does, what, as I said, it needs a lot of reinterpretation and reapplication. When you apply it, not to for your own family or community, but apply it to people who are suffering with indignity of labor outside. Then you should write by, by taking this logic to, let us say, a Dalit who is a shoemaker, a Dalit who is a cattle rearer, and getting treated as untouchable for that work, you tell them in a manner that, look, this is what this spiritual text tells. Therefore, you have a right to be liberated. But the point is that if you don't teach those who are outside you and don't write repeatedly explaining in the contextualized form, then it does not come to dominant position. It remains in a hidden form. Now, this I was asking even the, 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 the Bible experts, the Quran experts, 
even the, the Hindu text. You show me what is the idea of dignity of labor? What does this, the, this text say about this work? Washing clothes, washing dishes. Now tell me, if that is so, what is the household work of an average Muslim man by sharing every work in the house? How much they participate in homework, in washing clothes, in washing dishes, sweeping house, and uh, washing child? Uh, what is the level of participation? Did you ever do a practical uh, study on that? Yes, sir. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate you brought this question. I read most of your articles. And unfortunately, this is not religion, but this is a cultural one. We are born in India. We thought Muslim is superior, whereas in all Muslimic prophets, they have to herd a cattle, they have to herd sheep. And when it comes to household chores, one have to participate. Our last prophet clearly showed tells that being a man, one have to help his mother or his wife or his family in day-to-day -day chores. It's okay. unfortunate that we took it from the culture. We thought man in India, like, you know, it's who just sit down and talk a lot louder and don't do things at home. That's really unfortunate. You really no, no, can't... But see, you can't live as a teacher at unfortunate level. What is our role? Our role is to write repeatedly about it Start yeah. teaching in the schools that boy and girl should do both the things uh, at home. There, there is no sexual division of labor at home. So you have to write texts and teach them in the school and then make them practice in the school and then go on repeating, not just one day. So if you leave it that this is a cultural thing, this happened, therefore men sit there where they are and women do what double work they need to do whether this society or that society. That's where the social science comes. You have to write about it, constantly improve about it, teach about it. That's where the change comes, no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Excuse yeah. me, sir. Professor Elaya, can yeah, you please... Yeah, can you please, yeah, 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 please. Uh, uh, hmm. can you please elaborate on the role of education in safeguarding constitution? Like, would you please comment on the importance of minimum educational qualification as a prerequisite to contest elections and enjoy the privilege and power to participate in the process of constitutional amendment? Should the okay. present day educated youth be encouraged to enter politics in order to safeguard constitution and uphold constitutional values because position gives power. Well, uh, you know, there was a discussion about uh, the right to vote uh, in 1936 in India. Gandhi took a stand, like the British, that uh, those who are educated up to school graduation, landlords, and then uh, other high end people alone should get the right to vote. If you remember in a Britain also, the right to vote was first given to boroughs and pocket boroughs and Cambridge, Oxford kind of university graduates, so on and so forth. And for a long time, I think till 1946, there was no right to vote to women, whatever their qualification could be. So then it was Ambedkar who said, no, illiterates should also get right to vote based on their age, what we call adult franchise. Now, in a country of caste, which has influenced not only the outside uh, book-based religions, but the whole society. If you make educational qualification as the condition for contest, that's not right. And Ambedkar proved right. Illiterate people use their oath much better for their life improvement than most educated. You know, in America, 
the most educated country. What did they do in the last election? So the literacy and the graduation alone cannot be the yardstick for both voting and contesting. But that does not mean we should not improve the education for the whole population. Uh, my idea is, uh, given this level of population and illiteracy, you know, many times UP, which is least educated state, save democracy better than educated cities. Cities, people are not going to vote at all. Hyderabad municipal election, 42%. So um, given this, uh, Ambedkar was right, we can't link it to degrees and so on. But uh, how to make it uh, differently better functional is the constitutional problem. And uh, we need to take it up from multidimensional points. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Ji, thank you, sir. OK. Because the time is running very short. Yeah. Uh, of we course, your lecture, your lecture, your talk raises so many important points to think, to uh, debate, or to discuss. But yeah. as I said, <laughs> we are running very short. So I request Professor Fajda Siddiqui now to say a few words regarding today's program. Professor Farida Siddiqui, chairperson of uh, the Guru Dakshita Task Group. Excuse me, ma'am. Uh, she's gone outside, I think, uh, to make some correspondence with this uh, program. Okay, okay. I think she is busy with any other schedule. Before concluding. Okay, so it's uh, over to Dr. Taha, who is convener of this program. Uh, kindly um, present vote of thanks to Professor uh, uh, Kancha Elias, sir, and all the participants of this uh, today's program, today's session. Dr. Taha. No. <laughs> Okay, before uh, proposing word of thanks, I think there are two, three uh, questions. Since you have, uh, Sir, do we have time? Do we have time? Because it's five o'clock. That is what I'm asking. Sir, Ayla, sir, do we have time? If there, are, if there is time, you ask them. I'll briefly answer and we'll close it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Nisar Hussain. Please read, Doctor. Do you think that marginalized communities faced more discrimination post globalization than pre globalization? Yes, ghettoization, yes, ghettoization sees a sudden surge after 1990. Does there any relation between economic development and marginalization of downtrodden communities? No, globalization has a two-way impact. It uh, expanded market and it uh, uh, liberated some marginalized in different ways. And at the same time, it also has thrown people out of traditional jobs and uh, some amount of ghettoization in certain pockets. And, but now what is happening is with the new pandemic, all globalized economy got into a crisis. So uh, I am worried about the forthcoming food crisis and a basic uh, survival crisis because millions of jobs have gone and so on. So globalization has, I wrote long time back, cultural globalization it could and economic globalization has its uh, negative thing. It operates uh, that way in my view, yeah. Sir, one more important comment, uh, a kind of question only. Are there any measures that constitution inform about the rights of the people? In the sense, yeah, that, no, in the sense that whenever a political party has majority in both the houses of the parliament, how to restrain them attacking basic human rights of the people, like form acts of present day resign? Well, see the very strong majority, what they call brutal majority in parliaments and assemblies. Sometimes um, when there is no good opposition, uh, bring about authoritarian laws. 
uh, the, the in that situation, the only way is the people's uh, struggles. The farmers' agitation, anti-CAA agitation, all of them have shown that resilience and resistance. And therefore, you know, the political party system should come to a level where uh, ruling democracy and then strong opposition plus people's resistance movements need to constantly uh, sustain, otherwise there will be problems.